Hi, this is Phil from SkateTalk.com, and we are here with Jim Shafter, one of the world's most renowned boot fitters. But Jim also has a long experience working with Solomon when he, when you got out of racing. In fact, you did some development for Solomon on their boots back in the 1970s. And we're going to talk about the progression of the Solomon SX series of boots and where it started. And Jim, I'm going to let you talk about a little bit of the history of that boot. So when Solomon does a project, uh, they do a tremendous amount of R&D, which is not to say that other companies don't do that. But when they decided to get into the boot business, they absolutely um, you know, entrenched themselves in the world of boots and decided that instead of buying a factory and just trying to put their name on an existing product, that they would actually develop something from the ground up. And the parameters of that development, first of all, was that it had to ski extremely well and it had to fit well, which were two things and problems at the time that boots weren't very comfortable. Some didn't ski very well and they could also be very cold. So all of those things needed to be addressed on a technical side. But then there was also the aspect of how could we enter the market in a way in which we can build these boots that would be profitable from the beginning and starting up our own factory versus purchasing an existing factory. Now, in doing that, though, again, they took a lot of different measures. They started completely from the ground up, and they caught the industry by surprise, really, in a lot of different aspects. And one of that actually was the way that they sized boots. Absolutely. And the, the way that they sized boot became an interesting thing, because I think what was discovered was that the shapes or the last of existing boots didn't do a great job of actually holding the foot down and back into the boot. So they came up with this idea that if we took the foot, here's my leg, here's the foot, and we could go over the instep and hold the heel down and back, you would solve all of these control and fit problems by actually driving uh, the boot, uh, the foot to the back of the boot. So uh, along with measuring thousands of feet, which is how they started the project, they went around the world and they just measured feet everywhere to try and get some correlations and run them uh, in a lot of algorithms of the sizes to see you know, what would work to build boots off the shelf and then how much adaptability could there be in the boot to actually hold the foot down and back comfortably. So they came up with this idea of the heel instep perimeter, uh, which is the key aspect, and came up with a sizer to actually match the fit of the inside of the boot that allowed you to measure that heel instep perimeter as well as the length and the width of the boot to get you placed in the proper boot. And the single most important factor was the height of the instep and what it took to contain the foot. Was it okay if there was a little extra toe room? Absolutely. Greater warmth, greater comfort, greater balance when the toes were free. And so by holding the rear foot back and gripping the width, they were able to bring enough control to these rear entry boots to allow them to ski very well on snow. Two questions then. <laughs> One just makes too much sense. Why did Solomon get away from it and why did the the rest of the industry ignore it and move away from this? Because really, the, and again, we've had this discussion in the past, heel hold down containment is what, again, gives us control of the boot. So uh, I'll give you my answer to that in a way that may come from a slightly different angle, but it's this. So they established this new way of sizing they established this new way of building boots they established not a new way of entering the boots because rear entry had existed already for a number of years um, but a way of getting a rear entry boot to have a high level of performance was really the ticket so they developed all of these things and very quickly the competition saw that wait a minute they're grabbing market share they're gaining momentum people are liking the way they fit liking the way they ski and so we need to be doing the same thing. So the other major players in the market all started building rear entry boots. And here's some of the genius of Solomon is that each step of the R&D process included making patents on the things that they did that were unique. And the very first patent that's worth talking about is the cable that runs inside was controlled by uh, this adjustment here. You can see the cable comes out the back and it ran uh, up and over uh, the instep, but where it ran was underneath the pivot point of the cuff and the spoiler. And so by running it down and around this pivot point, the angle of the pullback was 
the perfect angle, which is about 45 degrees, to hold the heel down and prevent the foot from sliding forward. By patenting the path of the cable, no other supplier could run that path. So they either had to run the cable above the rivet, which made it pull back more than pull down, um, and or at one point, I think one of the manufacturers attempted to drill a hole in the rivet and run the cable through it, which also proved in court uh, to not be able to circumvent this patent. And so that was eliminated. So the idea here is by running the cable anywhere other than below the rivet eliminates the ability to pull the heel down and back. And that was part of the genius of the design of the SX90 was the angle. So that heel and step perimeter um, matched the way that it was measured so it pulled back at 45 degrees. Well, I'd also like to thank Lou Fisner on the East Coast, who actually supplied us with the helix step perimeter measuring device, which are extremely scarce. I've been looking, one, looking for one for a while. So thanks, Lou, for that. What's interesting, this is Solomon's 75th anniversary year, and they're promoting that a lot. And we've got a tremendous book about the 75th anniversary. But what's really odd in the book, there was not much discussion about this. Well, I, I would definitely find that interesting <laughs> because I think part of it, and it says it kind of all on the cover, the man on the cover here is uh, George Solomon. And uh, George was an incredible uh, thinking man's man. And his ability to build a team and get them to sell him on the R&D and the concepts um, was part of his genius as an inventor and an owner of this company. And so... Um, I, I'm not surprised that they don't get down deep in the woods on the detail of it all, but so much of what these guys did with the production of these boots that were quite different and then eventually moving it away from this into boots that were successful with four buckles, which happened later into the 90s, uh, as well as introducing skis into the marketplace, which were done a very similar way. And I also don't want to forget about the time they introduced the boot, they also developed a Nordic system that was quite unique with shoes that close differently, that fit differently, and a binding system that worked specifically with the sole that Solomon developed and patented. Okay, now our first generation boots, the 90 series, and there was a 60, 70, um, 90, and also a, a 50 and 80, which was slightly different. That evolved into the early 80s, and then they came out with a wildly popular SX90-91, and we've got two versions of it here. One is one of the prototypes, which actually was Steve McKinney's boot. And this is going to come up to the U.S. Ski and Snowboard Hall of Fame for Steve's um, display up there. This was provided to us uh, by one of his friends. Um, and people say, well, rear entry boots aren't performance. They can't go fast. We're talking about the fastest boots on earth. I mean, all of his speed skiers are using SX boots. So there was a time period that, that that was the case. And I think a lot of that might have just been sheer um, yeah, ability, yeah, sure. ability to cut the wind. Um, but in addition to that, though, I want to take it away just from plain uh, speed skiing. Yeah. But to say that in uh, 1985, Mark Giardelli won the overall yeah. World Cup on Solomon SX90 Akeep boots. And people love to say, oh, my God, well, of course he won on those boots. They were heavily modified or they were custom or they were, you know, they were langs with painted, you know, they had actually invisible buckles yeah. or whatever people wanted to say about it. But the fact of the matter was, is that two overall World Cup titles were won by Giardelli on this SX90 model. So um, I think Solomon, from the very beginning, didn't develop a boot to have incredible market appeal and incredible sales. They developed a boot that would ski as well as the existing models or better at the time. And surely Giardelli was able to prove that as he moved his technique along with the design of the boot to allow him to be one of the fastest ski racers in the world for a time period. Yeah. I know Ross Anderson um, actually still skis and still uh, does some speed skiing in, in an SX boot too, but these were very interesting. We had the, uh, the memory, as, I'm sorry, the memo came on the later ones, but the adjustable flex on this, the ability, the adjustment was incredible on this. Uh, this one actually, the football, the, the depth is out, but the amount of <laughs> ramp, angle. ramp in this and a lot of forward lean too but that, yeah. that was the era of the boots correct and and really the improvements that the market asked for out of the sx90 to the 91 were things like uh, lighter weight a little bit more svelte look to it mm -hmm. uh, as well as flex adjustment forward lean adjustment 
Um, it were things that the other suppliers were offering at the time where in the marketplace, those things were considered important uh, when you were purchasing a boot. And so the SX90 was pretty much a no frills boot. It didn't have a whole lot of forward lean adjustment, didn't have a lot of flex adjustment, although it was a minor. And the setup and the boot board was pretty specific to the skis at the time where on this boot, the boot board got improved. The adjustability of the fit got improved. Flex adjustment, forward lean adjustment, um, and you know micro adjustment on the, the buckles. All of those things came in to make this uh, a better skiing boot and a more popular uh, commercial boot in the ski shops. So uh, before we delve and get into the mo modern um, SX boots, we're talking, I'm going to go back to this here and talk about as far as how we measure feet now. And again, in your shop and when you were boot fitting, and sorry, this is from a competing uh, company, but it is one of also one of our partners, but measuring that vamp area. And as I know, quickly, there's some things that you look for when you're doing that. Yeah, so the first thing I look for is a discrepancy between the length of the foot and the vamp or the instep perimeter. Um, and that's really what this device showed. So if you had a really high instep and you pulled uh, the marker, it would be tight on the instep before it got down to the smaller sizes. And if you had a really low volume foot, it would get down to the smaller length and still be somewhat loose here. And so it helped balance that out. And so when I'm fitting boots, um, not only do I measure the length, which is now all Mondo point, which is essentially centimeters, um, the width, you know, which just gives us some idea of, you know, what the forefoot's like. And then we still come in at 45 degrees with a millimeter measurement or a centimeter measurement. And we try and see how closely this measurement matches the length. If it's the exact same, let's say you measure a 27 and your instep uh, measurement is a 27, we can bet that it's a pretty good match into the boot that I'm going to try on you, unless I know that the volume of the instep of that boot is really low or the volume of that instep is really high. But it gives me the ability as a boot fitter to kind of use this technology on all of the current boots that we sell, planning to have the hold down back across the, the instep perimeter into the back of the boot, whether it's got four buckles uh, or two buckles or one buckle in the case of the rear entry boots, um, you get the same net effect that you're able to hold the foot down and back. And that's where your control of your edging, your ankle starts there. So technology that was developed 40 some years ago, really you're still, and we're still using today's fit process. Yeah. And again, like I said, I would love to steal this from Lou Flazar <laughs> because I've been looking for one of these for years now. And I think it would be a great addition to really simplify the use of yeah. this tool. It would just be put the foot in, draw the deal and see if it hits the instep first or length first. Yeah. So, so again, I, same thing is I'd love to see one us go back to this type of measuring because right now using, again, we're going to get into the weeds a little bit here. Manufacturers are using 97, 100, whatever widths involved in, in selling and marketing boots. That's in a part of the boot in that four foot area. That's so easy to work on. That back half of the boot where we're addressing here is probably the most difficult part to change in a boot. For sure. And, um, you know, the, the, the mental conception is, is that with four buckles, you know, it's, it's a total movable feast and you can have as much or as little volume. But the problem is, is the buckles only move so much in the yeah. shape of the shell inherently is the shape of the shell and that's very hard to modify so that's why that's the part of the foot that we want to make sure fits the boot that we're putting you into easy to modify the forefoot of the boot easy to modify the length of the boot easy to modify the boot for any oddities but when it comes to holding the heel down and back not such an easy process with the current designs you would think that um, these numbers that they give you and a lot of times they use that four foot number like 98 or 100 like it's an actual volume and I would say if it's actual volume why isn't it in milliliters yeah. and why don't we have this concept of sealing the boot off pouring water into it measuring how many milliliters of water it takes to fill the vessel and that's how much volume is in that boot and once again you can't just do that outright because the boots volume is somewhat adjustable based on the buckles and the way you can close the boot down but to get the best fit, you have to start with this initial love match between the height and the instep of the boot. Uh, and that's really the key, regardless of how the boot is entered or exited, you need to be able to hold the foot down and back. Yeah. 
Okay. Now, getting into the last generation of SX boots, yep. and that got into starting with the SX92 and its lower versions here, the women's version, the 82, but it evolved into a 93 and also a 95. These boots lasted into the, the mid-90s, but this is probably one of the most versatile boots out of the box of any boot ever produced. And in fact, to the point where they even gave you a huge bag of additional parts yeah. for valgus wedges, varus wedges, uh, for in uh, to work on your arch area. You had the shims for the back of the boot. You had different lugs that were available yep. to swap out for canting the boots. Absolutely. The stuff that was available for this boot. And we've got two versions here. We've got the regular SX-92. Uh, uh, and then we also have the Akeep, where this one actually is the race, the race. version. Yeah. There was a regular um, Akeep that had the same beer tap closure as this here. But this one here, they brought back the old closure that we had here. Then later versions, when you got into the force boots and the later ones also did include a power strap up yeah. top. But I was really looking to see if I can find one of the bag of all those oh, goodies yeah. but i mean they're really tough to find but the interesting going with this boot and we just had these boots out this year skiing the ability of adjusting the flex i mean the boots are really tired and they got to the point they were flex on demand we flexed in the boot and we actually had to break the pressure back there was no life left but other than having too much forward lean the boot still skis really well yeah so a couple of things i want to okay. say about this new series so the first thing was one for the commercial aspect and the retail aspect and that was the development of this one single rear buckle that if you look has two cables one that goes to the closure of the boot and the second one goes to the tightness of the heel instep perimeter so this one has a buckle for the heel instep perimeter and a buckle that was independent for the closure of the boot so the idea here was combining those two things made it even easier to use, simpler to sell, and it made it an absolute powerhouse at retail um, for a number of years, all the way through the 93 series, which still some of those models contain this single adjustment. Um, anecdotally, I have to tell you a little story about the arguments that we got into on the product side of trying to decide whether this was the closure or this was the closure. And I can tell you all the hardcores that were sitting around the table back in the day thought this was a gimmick and a joke and it wasn't for great skiers and you had to have independent closure and independent fit. But the reality is, is that when this hit the market, the sales for Solomon Booth just absolutely went off the charts. And I was telling Phil this story earlier, but the, the profit generated from these two series of boots was enough to allow Solomon to build a brand new modern ski factory and come into the ski market. So these were incredibly profitable based on how they were built and how they were manufactured. So. Oh, what's cool is again, we have actually a whole section on our site, SX in the wild, where people have just pictures of people still skiing this boot. We have one of our members, Mike Foote, actually who skied the big couloir at Big Sky in an SX boot, very well, probably the only pair this century that they came down in uh, in one piece in the boots, but I thought was really interesting. And we're talking 30, 40, basically almost 50 year old technology by the time this was originally started in development. What other boot other than the flex on the, the boots based on the flex on are people still skiing from that era? No, not too many. And one of the, the direct answers as to why is most all of the boots at the time were being produced out of polyurethane. Polyurethane is an amazing material. The best race boots are still built primarily out of uh, polyurethane or polyether, which is a, a twin to polyurethane. Um, but what was so interesting about these boots is they were able back in the day to lighten the weight and build the boots at a lower cost because these shell materials weren't made out of polyurethane. They were made out of uh, some blends of uh, some stiffer plastics. And the reason why they could get away with that is the design of these boots was very mechanical in its nature and the plastic didn't need to wrap the foot the way that an overlap boot did. So they didn't need the elasticity of polyurethane. And so they could build these out of these lightweight nylon infused plastics that were extremely durable. And even 30 years later, they don't fall apart yeah. like we've seen a lot of the polyurethanes do that yeah. either by just simple age, exposure to cold, exposure to sun, 
uh, eventually you'll see guys, you know, out on the mountain yeah. with uh, a toe completely <laughs> cracked off a boot or walking in the lodge with their liners sticking out. Um, that wasn't a typical deal with uh, the Solomon. Um, the other thing was the longevity of the 92s and up increased dramatically because these soles uh, were replaceable. They just screwed on and slid on and got screwed in. And so, you know, one of the things that knocks a boot out of the deal is, you know, wear of the hard molded sole. And when there aren't either replacement parts or they can't be fixed or repaired, um, then they're no longer on the hill. But these boots, as long as you can find some of those older screw on soles, you can have a brand new sole back on your boot and it's going to last forever, which is why you can have guys yep. 30 years down the road still actually skiing in these boots. It's probably more likely that the liner material, which was an injected polyurethane, starts to get crumbly and weird uh, versus the actual uh, shell breaking. But um, they were two really interesting concepts of one, how they made these injected polyurethane liners, which were very cheap to produce and very easy to do fit work on. And they made these nylon based plastics that were also very inexpensive to build with and still delivered ski uh, control. And part of the, the concept that came along with those materials was this idea of the flex adjustments. And um, this can be raised or lowered to increase or decrease the amount of flex in the boot. And the original idea was a single sided one, but in a more modern version on the 92s and 93s, they put double flex adjustments, which could allow you to actually change a little bit the way the boot drove the ski either inward or outboard. So you could either have them symmetrical and even or you could set them up just like this one where one might be low, one might be high, and it made the boot track differently and flex differently as well. So these were quite ingenious and necessary because these materials were so hard and stiff and we needed a way to control the flex. Now, I know you've worked with numerous manufacturers and consultings on boots and they come to you for your expertise. If Solomon called this afternoon and said, Jim, we wanna make a new SX, what would you take from these boots and what would you change? Well, so the first thing I, I would do is get right back to <laughs> get right back to here. I'd go out and build about 10,000 of these sizers and distribute them into the market. <laughs> uh, and then the second thing I would do is go back to using the principle of having this be the control of the hold down. Um, so I think that uh, at this point, all of the patents are past their date. So yeah. no one would be, including Solomon, you know, uh, imposing anything by going back to the travel path of the hold down internally. Um, that's really, I think, the, the, the place I would start. The other thing, too, which is, is not so obvious, but this is another way in which Solomon was able to really capitalize um, profitability on these boots, was that the number of shell sizes which was reduced dramatically. Um, in the old days, they used to use uh, actually English sizing, which is close to American sizing. Uh, so Lang, for example, to build a full size run of boots from 3 to 13, I'm going to count out loud here so I can figure it out. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. That's 11 yep. lower shell sizes that they have to build a mold for, which is very expensive to build those molds. Whereas Solomon, at the time they introduced, um, you'll see here it goes 290 to 360, but in the very beginning they didn't produce any 290s. Uh, and 360s kind of came slowly afterwards. But that means there were one, two, three, four, five, six, seven sizes built originally. So once again, in terms of thinking about profitability, if I could size the majority of the market with seven shells instead of 11 shells, I'm 50%. Yeah, I'm like way ahead uh, of my competitors. And so I would get back to that same concept yeah. uh, of because we're holding the foot down and back, we're not as concerned about you know, the sole size being the determinant of how it's going to fit the foot. And that allows us to go back and build less shells and to be more profitable and work quicker on our feet to make changes and develop new boots when you only have to do seven shells versus 11. Yep. Okay. And again, with this here, we've got a ton of adjustability of this series where this was billed as their high end boot in 92. But the way this boot could be set up, a beginner could get in this boot and have the adjustment for them. Absolutely. It's a one time purchase. And, and, and that was also kind of interesting, I think, where Solomon eventually did something where um, boots from the origin, there would be one model, one mold built, and it would be made out of a stiff plastic, and that would be the performance of the race boot. Yeah. And then they would shoot the exact same boot in the exact same mold out of a slightly softer 
uh, blend of polyurethane. And then another one, and the whole line would go boom, 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 but they would all be the same boot. And I think what Solomon did was pretty interesting is they were able to take this technology and flip it sideways and say, okay, you have race boots, you have high performance boots, you have free ride boots. Uh, at one point they had models called EXP, which were yep. for ski instructors. And under each one, they might have multiple price points. And so they started selling more boots in a different way that people kind of pick their boots, not because it was a version of the race boot, but because it fell in the category of who they saw themselves being on the mountain. So a ski instructor, a free ride skier, a ski racer, uh, a beginner, and each one had kind of its group and that allowed them to sell even more models into the marketplace. Jim, a little sidebar here. Now, let's talk about SX in the movies. Absolutely. So we had, uh, in Blizzard of Oz, SX was the focus boot in that. Schmidt skied it, Plague skied it, Hatrop skied it. So, I mean, it had a lot of focus there, but it started before that. Absolutely. And so one, one of the things I think that Solomon has done extremely well over the years is they've had amazing people in marketing. And fairly early on, they established a relationship with Greg Stump. And so from the very beginning, there was this relationship building between Solomon supplying product, uh, which at that time was only boots and bindings. Mm -hmm. um, and the skis generally were K2s in a lot of the films. Um, but through that marketing connection with Stump, the exposure of Solomon SX-91s and then SX-92s about the time that Blizzard of Oz hit yep. uh, was an absolute explosion. And um, uh, being here in Northern California at the time, to me, the most interesting thing was how many Scott Schmidt clones <laughs> were up skiing around at Squaw with that North Face yellow and, and navy yep. uh, trim, the extreme, yep. one, one piece that he used, and the Solomons and the K2s. Yeah, the, the DHs he the, was on. Exactly, nine, either DHs or I think the KBC was yep. introduced then yep. uh, and then later you know, got into the whole extreme thing. But, but at any rate, so the, the movies played an incredibly important part and it wasn't just Stump because there were some international efforts at yep. all. Um, don't remember the European filmmakers, but there was a, some amazingly funky stuff that was shot in Chamonix and Teen um, that was both entertaining, some amazing skiing, but as a company, Solomon was really good um, at attacking at all different areas of the market. So I talked earlier about uh, my connection with racing and how much they invested there. But for every dollar they invested in racing, they were investing dollars in film production and exposure on the hill with like tech testing team programs where ski instructors were supplied product and uniforming from Solomon, coaches, things like that to kind of hit on all cylinders in all parts of the market to help promote these products. Now, this was great. I, it was a lot of fun talking about these here. And again, with this whole process and being in the movies and the acceptance of this rear entry boot, which really set the standards for it. Yeah. And I think I think this was really good. Changed the industry. Solomon was very progressive that way and making changes. The industry be damned. This is what we feel is the right way to do it. Yeah. Um, but what was interesting, though, is they didn't all of a sudden just cut one thing for the other. No. So the the work with the films, the work with those um, those athletes and those people that were skiing in the films was all part of the process of getting the exposure to the product along with what they were doing in ski racing. And, you know, sometimes because I came from that field and I worked for Solomon on that side of the deal, um, I always felt that results were important, but they weren't what was selling the product in the shops. Um, what it was doing more than anything, it was giving the people who were associated with the brand, the reps, the people who worked in the office, the tech testing team and the coaches that we provided product for, it gave them this feeling that we were high performance, that we were you know, excellent at what we did, that we brought good products to the market and it just gave this really nice vibe you know, to the whole thing. And so that came from the way in which they marketed and the movies for sure were amazing and we wouldn't be where we were today without the work of Greg Stone. Well, uh, Jim, thanks a ton, a wealth of information. We went way over what we normally do, but again, I was, <laughs> I just enjoyed it so much listening to all this. We're going to have the chapters in here. Any other products that you would like to see revisions of and going back and talking about, put them in the comments section below. And remember, folks, skiing is fun. Hi, this is Wayne Wong. And remember, skiing is fun, especially the long way. Yeah.
If you enjoyed this informative video, hit that bell, subscribe so that you'll stay up to date on the new videos, and check out SkiTalk.com for more ski-related content. Also, please follow SkiTalk.com on all of your social media channels. No clams were shocked during the course of this video.